I said, I think it's a little bit more interesting. So what we're going to look at is ultimately intermolecular forces and then what these inter intermolecular forces do for us. Uh, we're going to look at water in particular. Uh, any guesses why we might look at water? Where do almost all of our reactions occur? In water. So we're going to be primarily concerned about the properties of water because that's where they're going to determine how our overall reactions run. Okay? So if we look at a very simple overview, okay, all of chemistry is looking at how two atoms interact. Okay? Everything. You look at gases. How do we decide gases? Well, we're saying gases don't interact. What physical properties come out of it? Okay? When we look at a liquid, what physical properties do we get when two atoms interact a little bit more? What physical properties do we get out of solids when, they're, when we make them interact even further? Okay? When we looked at Lewis structures, it's specifically what things are interacting between those two atoms and how does that turn into an overall shape. So everything we've talked about this semester comes back to just two atoms and how each of those two atoms interact with each other. Okay? We then have to generate number systems to quantify all that fun stuff, but that's kind of a secondary issue. Okay? So the next big question will be what makes up an atom? So what do we have in atoms? Protons, neutrons, and electrons. So it's a nice general review as far as that material goes. What's our symbol for protons? P, symbol for neutrons. N, symbol for electrons, E. What is the charge on a proton? Positive 1. Where is the charge written when we're looking at our subatomic particles? It's a little bit weird with the subatomic particles. Where is it written? It's definitely on the left. Our subatomic particles get that weird notation. Um, and now I'm panicking because I don't remember. Uh, I believe the upper left is for mass and the lower left is for our charge, which is our, only for our subatomic particles. It's our nuclear notation, okay? So you might want to check that. I can get away with cheating for the protons. Why? What's the mass of a proton? One, and the charge is one. So, yay, cheating. Doesn't matter where I put it because it's the same number. What happens when we get to the neutron? What's the charge on a neutron? Zero. It has no charge. What's its mass? It's the mass of a neutron. It's the same mass as a proton. A proton was one AMU. Neutron is one AMU. Anybody happen to check already so you can confirm that I'm wrong? I mean confirm that I'm right. And for an electron, what's the charge on an electron? Negative one, and its mass? It's the mass on our electron, effectively. Zero. Okay. Our electrons, if you remember that number, is one over 1874, I think, the weight of a proton. So they are so much smaller than a proton that we effectively say their mass is zero. Did you just find it, Thor? No, no. Okay. It's top right. Top right is? It depends which notation you're running. If you're running nuclear notation, it's different. Yeah, that's not nuclear notation. Okay. Big things that you need to pull out of this, regardless of how you write your notation. What charge is the proton? Plus one. What charge is the neutron? Plus zero, that works. Charge on the electron? Negative one. That becomes massively important to us. Okay? Why is the charge on our proton and our neutron and our electron important? Where do our protons exist? in the nucleus. So as we get to bigger atoms, we end up putting more protons into the nucleus. There's more positive, positive repulsion. So what do we need to do to neutralize that positive repulsion? We put in more neutrons. 
okay, to stabilize that nucleus. We now have a very positive, <coughs> densely packed nucleus. Okay? That's a lot of charge. Charge is bad. How do we stabilize that charge permanently? We need electrons. So our protons and electrons effectively spin around each other to neutralize their overall charge. Okay? That attractive force is what's giving us our individual atoms. We throw in the neutrons to kind of balance things out a little bit further, make sure that we don't get that positive-positive repulsion. All right? So when we build atoms, we bring a positive near a negative. Why? Because our charges are bad. I sure hope that didn't fall on you guys. Our charges are bad, and we want to neutralize that overall charge. I don't think it's going to fall. It's just making weird noises. Okay? So that's how we put together atoms. What happens when we want to now put atoms together into molecules? What kind of prediction might we guess there? Well, we're going to find a partial positive atom in one case and a partial negative atom in the other case. And what happens? Because they're now slightly charged, we bring them near each other. They connect, and they now form some type of interaction or some type of bond. What's going to allow them to form that bond? It is that positive and negative. <coughs> But to actually form a bond, what do they have to do? They have to share electrons. Why do they share the electrons and not, say, the protons or neutrons? The electrons are furthest away from everything. They're the thing that's going to be most likely to interact first. So when we're looking at building larger molecules, it's our outer shell of electrons that's going to interact. What do we refer to those outer shell as? The valence electrons. Okay, so when we're looking at uh, chemistry, really all we're concerned about is the valence shell of electrons. Those are the only shells that we really need to worry about. Everything else is so densely packed in the middle that we don't need to worry about it anymore. Okay? So at a very basic, simple level, we can ignore those sections. Okay? So let's change this up again. We now have a carbon and a hydrogen, and we want to try and make an atom or molecule out of them. Right? It can be a bit dicey to go through and look at the exact quantum mechanics on what's happening within this. So what we can do is switch this up a little bit. If we have two atoms completely independent of each other, effectively what we have are two things happy on their own, don't need to interact. Eventually what happens? Those two atoms get close enough to each other that what happens? They start to interact. Say, oh, that one looks a little positive. I'm a little negative. Let's see what happens then they can get a little bit closer until eventually they start to get close enough that what happens? They share their electrons, and depending on the situation, they may share completely. If they share completely, what we've gone through and done has made a bond. So what we're doing is gradually bringing these closer to each other, and we're starting to see an interaction build. As that interaction gets stronger and stronger, we eventually marry these two atoms next to each other, and we now have effectively one new unit. Okay, good. I'm glad you guys thought it was funnier than the first time I showed this. Okay? So what we're concerned about at this point now is what are those interactions at each of these individual stages. Okay? So we could relate it back to how couples interact and eventually become married. Okay? Each of those stages has a slightly different system. Okay? There might just be some random look across the room where one person panics and all of a sudden we now have some type of attraction. Then maybe there's a dating process. Then it's married. Okay? Fairly rarely do we ever say there's two independent things and whoop, now they're married. Okay? Usually doesn't happen very much, at least in our current societal <laughs> system. Okay? We have those individual stages. Atoms effectively have that same type of individual stages as they move all the way to making that full-on bond. And so what we're concerned about is what are each of those stages? Can we classify them according to different rules? You did have a hand. Yes. Um, so when atoms are bonding, is it really like the electrons themselves that are being attracted to the protons? And yes. Okay. Okay. So when we initially bring our two atoms near each other, I guess lost my structure, we are saying the electrons are the first things to interact. But it's not the electrons from one atom and the electrons of the other atom interacting with each other. Because if they did, what happens? They repel. What we're looking at is getting those atoms close enough that the outer electrons on one atom sees 
the nucleus on the other. Those electrons now start to share with the other nucleus. So what ends up happening is we're getting a cross flow of those electrons going to the opposite atom's uh, nuclei. That's causing a larger density of electrons between the two atoms. We now have that bond. Okay. Questions about that? So long as the electron, the valence cell that share the electron. The valence shell are what we're concerned about sharing electrons. Okay. And if our valence shell, say, in a positively charged atom is empty, that just means it can accept electrons into it to generate that weak interaction. Okay, so it's still always the valence shell, that outermost shell, okay, that outermost energy level. Whether there's electrons in it or not, that's going to allow for our interaction. Okay, well, what type of bonds do we? Whoop, hey, skip that. What type of bonds do we have? Ionic. We've got ionic, polar covalent, and covalent bonds. Those are our three primary categories when we're looking at bonds. And when we're talking about bonds, we can add an extra little phrase to this. We can call these intramolecular attractions. Okay? What do we mean by intramolecular? It's within the molecule. So we are looking at how two atoms interact and how they're actually sharing the electrons within that compound, within that molecule. Okay? What different things could we add on here as far as information for our ionic, polar covalent, and covalent? Okay, where you find them. There's a good idea. Where can you find each of these types of bonds? So your ionic bond, we've specified as a metal and a non-metal. Was there a better definition that you will not be responsible for, but it's nice to know about? What's that? So metal and non-metal, you'll also see cations and anions, which is a, probably a better definition. Okay, and the example that I could come up with there would be if we looked at the compound of ammonium hydroxide. Okay, ammonium, all nonmetals. Hydroxide, all nonmetals. And yet, what type of bond do we have between ammonium and hydroxide? It's an ionic bond. Why is it an ionic bond? Because ammonium is a polyatomic cation. Hydroxide is a polyatomic anion. Okay. Why do we seldom look at our definition as cation and anion? How many different cations do we have that are not metals? Can count it on one finger. One. That one is ammonium. Okay, NH4, or technically NH4 plus. Okay, so that's why we typically don't use our cation anion definition, though that is strictly the better definition to work with. Okay, so our approximation is a metal and a non-metal. Is there an even better definition that we could work with? Everybody's least favorite, and if you have to move into organic chemistry, you better start liking it. I used this symbol for it. Anybody remember that? The difference in electronegativity between the two atoms must be greater than 1.7. It's our strictest definition. It's also arguably probably one of our most useless. Why would that be fairly not useful? How many of you know your electronegativities? No. Okay, well, if you don't know your electronegativities, you need a better way to define and determine whether you have an ionic bond or not. Is it important to be able to classify an ionic bond? Yes, it does a couple things for you. One, it gives you the correct rules to be able to name things, so that's pretty huge. Okay? The other thing that's very, very helpful with your ionic bonds is if you're trying to determine oxidation states, you can figure out the oxidation states because you can determine the charge on each of the ions. Once you know the charge on the ion, you can then calculate the oxidation state. Okay? What other types of bonds do we have? Okay, since I heard covalent, give me a definition. 
what can you work with? Okay, we're looking at non-metal bonds. Problem with that definition? Mm. What's our definition of a polar covalent bond? Non-metal bonds. Okay, so our polar covalent and our covalent bonds both have the exact same definition right now. That's a pretty crappy place to be. So we need to expand one of those definitions. We could go with electronegativities, which is the traditional way to do that. Again, I would argue that's an awful way to do it because you don't know your electronegativities. Okay, your covalent bonds are traditionally marked as less than, a difference less than uh, 0.5, and your polar covalent bonds are greater than 0.5, sorry, it's a bit crowded, and smaller than 1.7. How else could we define these? To get a covalent bond, we're looking at a difference in electronegativity less than 0.5. What kind of bond would I expect when I bond carbon next to carbon? Covalent. Why is it going to be covalent? You don't know the electronegativities. They're both the same atom, so the difference is going to be zero, which is less than 0.5. So instead of defining it as differences in electronegativity, we can say same atom to same atom. Bond to same atom. Okay? Probably our much better definition when we're looking at covalent bonds. That is a very, very narrow definition, and that only gives us a zero value. That's never going to get us up into that 0.5 range. Okay? So the one kind of expounding that you can push from that, okay, particularly when it comes to organic chemistry, is same bottom, same bo uh, same atom bound to same atom, and also carbon to hydrogen. Okay. Are there other bonds that classify according to covalent? Yeah. How would you figure those out? You'd need the electronegativities. It's going to be a whole lot more work than is really necessary. We'd never ask you that kind of question, okay, unless we gave you the electronegativities. Yeah. You do not need to know the electronegativities. Okay. So how do we determine what our polar covalence bonds are? It's anything that's not covalent, but it's still nonmetals bound to each other. Okay. If you're going to push into organic chemistry, we simplify our periodic table, and what we end up saying is anything bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or a halogen. Okay. So if you see anything bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or a halogen, we're now looking at a polar covalent bond. So what we've got are now our bulk classifications for each of those bonds. In theory, this should all be reviewed. Okay. What can we do now with this information? Well, we're interested in how we get to a bond. Remember, if we looked at those silly pictures, I'm about to tap away from this. What we just classified is what happens in the different marriages of our atoms. How well do they share their stuff? Okay. Do they share their electrons really well or not so well? What about these other intermediate stages? We haven't said anything about those. Okay, so what we need to do is further define those categories. So let's take a look at some examples. Okay, this is really four quadrants, but I wanted all the information on one slide, so I stepwise through it. Let's take a look at our upper left hand, sodium chloride. Good. What we're now concerned about is not how sodium interacts with chloride in that molecule. I want to know how that molecule interacts with another molecule. Okay? And I could line up that other set of molecules on either the left or the right, but for sake of argument or simplicity, I decided to line it up all on the right. So I'm taking a look at how chloride interacts with another molecule of sodium chloride. Well, really, there's two possibilities. I can have my chloride interact with sodium on another molecule, or I can have it interact with chloride on another molecule. Which interaction is preferred, top or bottom? Wow, that was pretty fast. Everybody gave me top. Why is the top interaction preferred? 
If we go through, we could go through and say it keeps the pattern. Let's push that a little bit further, though. Okay, what type of bond do we have between sodium and chlorine? What kind of bond is there between sodium, which is a metal, and chloride, which is a non-metal, ionic. So this is really sodium of what charge? Plus one. And chloride of what charge? A negative one. Those charges are then going to apply to our other molecule as well. Why would we prefer the top interaction? We're trying to match up those opposite charges. How did we build atoms? We matched up protons with electrons because the opposite charges needed to neutralize. What's happening now when we try and match up larger or bring molecules together? Exact same process. We find a positive, and we match it up with our negative. We find a negative, we match it up with our positive. And we don't do the other interaction because the other interaction puts more charge in that small space. And we want our charge minimized as much as possible. So when we look at this interaction, we do not see the bottom interaction work. Okay? What happens if we say move to, let's see, how challenging do I want to get? Let's go to the carbon-hydrogen. Let's make this obnoxiously challenging. Same idea. Which interaction is favored, top or bottom? What type of bond is there between carbon and hydrogen? A covalent bond, which means what about the electrons between the carbon and the hydrogen? They are equally shared, which means what charge builds on the carbon or the hydrogen? Silence is a pretty good answer. None. Hmm, that's a bit tricky. Let's come back to that. Let's try a different one. Let's take a look at, which one do you want to look at, OC or OH? OC, there we go. Let's take a look at that interaction. Which one's favored, top or bottom? Same process as we went through with our first case, our sodium chloride. We want to go through and evaluate what's happening within our bond first. What type of bond do we have between oxygen and carbon? It is a polar covalent bond. Okay, why do we know it's polar covalent? Because carbon classifies as anything bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or halogen. We have a polar covalent bond here. What does that do to the molecule? Okay, so when we're looking at a polar covalent bond, we're saying it's polar because we generate some partial charges. Okay, where are those partial charges coming from? Where do the electrons in that carbon-oxygen bond spend most of their time? It spends most of its time with the more electronegative atom, which is oxygen. Okay? So that oxygen starts to gain electrons, which means it becomes negative. negative. Well, if oxygen gained electrons, what happened to the carbon? It lost electrons. The only time we can show these full-on plus and minuses is if we have an ionic bond. Do we have an ionic bond? No. So we need a new notation. What was that new notation? What was that? A little weird thing. Yeah, that works. You say nope? Oh, delta. I was like, no, that's totally right. We're doing a delta symbol, okay, a lowercase delta. We're saying that we are generating those charges as partial charges. They are not full-on negative, not full-on positive, but part way to becoming negative and positive. Well, if we could do it for that molecule of OC, what can we do with the other ones? The exact same thing. What happens with our bottom one? Carbon's still positive, our oxygen's still negative. Which interaction now is more favored? Top or bottom? The top because plus and minus. 
You find the positive, you match it up with the negative. You find a negative, you match it up with the positive. The bottom one is doing what interaction? The carbon to the carbon, that's plus plus. Puts too much positive charge in the same location. That bottom interaction is bad. Okay? So all we're trying to do with all of these in individual interactions is start to minimize that charge as best we can, any way we can. Okay? Questions about either of these two, the ionic or our polar covalent situations? Okay, because it definitely gets more confusing in this next step. Okay, we're going to accept it. What happens when we go back to our carbon and hydrogen? What charge build on the, built on the carbon? Which is more electronegative, carbon or hydrogen? What did we say that was the type of bond between carbon and hydrogen? Covalent. In a covalent bond, what are we saying about the electrons? Zero. They are being shared equally. Which means, what charge is on that carbon? What charge is it shown right now as? Nothing. There's no charge written there. What can we do with the only electrons supplied? Can those electrons go towards the carbon? Okay. Sometimes they could, but they could equally go to the hydrogen. So at some point with this molecule, whoops, we should go back to the purple, our carbon could be partially negative, which would mean the hydrogen would be partially positive. Because we've defined our carbon and hydrogen now as equally sharing those electrons, those electrons have an equal opportunity to be found on the hydrogen. Ooh, which means what charge does the hydrogen become? Becomes negative, which means the carbon would have to be positive. Interesting. What does that mean about which interaction is favored? They are both equally probable. Right? We do not get a permanent positive and negative charge like we got in our ionic. We don't even get a partial charge like we got in our polar covalent bond. The interaction that we end up generating in this covalent bond is a temporary dipole or a temporary charge. Some of the time, hydrogen is going to be positive. Some of the time, hydrogen will be negative. That's going to drastically change how it interacts with another molecule. Okay? Which means we ultimately get two different representations or two different possible alignments. Both of these work. Why does that make it a little bit trickier? Instead of having only one alignment, we have two. That's going to change those probable outcomes from that. Okay, let's take it a step further. If we look at the sodium chloride interaction, okay, the one that we've got in red, how strong would we expect that to be? Really strong or really weak? Okay, we have a formal positive charge. What did we say was bad about charge? Sorry, let me try that again. Is charge good or bad? <laughs> it's bad. Okay? Think about your electrical outlets. You stick a fork into the electrical outlet, you get a whole lot of charge. Not a good thing to do. Okay? So that is exceptionally bad. So anytime you build a charge, that needs to be stabilized. How do we stabilize that positive charge? We need to put it as close as possible to a negative. Okay? Since it is so unstable, when we bring in that negative, how tightly are they going to interact with each other? Very, very, very tightly. We're going to get a very strong interaction generated in our upper left-hand corner because we have those permanent charges. What happens when we move to the blue? Do we still have some partial charge? Yes. Those partial charges are going to align in that particular fashion to try and mitigate that charge imbalance. Okay? 
Would we expect it to be as strong as the ionic? Why not? Less charge. So what we would get, for lack of a better word, some kind of medium strength interaction. What happens when we move to the purple one? Do we really have charges to even balance out? No. So our single carbon hydrogen molecule says, I'm fine on my own. If it's fine on its own, does it even want to interact with anything else? No. So if we force it to interact, how strong should that interaction be? Very, very weak. Because okay? we don't have those partial charges to really have it interact to any great strength. To get that strong interaction, what type of bond was required? We needed an ionic bond. To get that medium interaction, what type of bond was required? A polar covalent bond. To get that weak interaction, what type of bond did we need? Covalent. So now the new fun question, okay, relatively our new material. Is the interaction in our sodium chloride, okay, what I've got drawn as a dashed line, the same as the solid line between, in our sodium chloride? So is the solid line the same as the dashed line? How do you know it's different? Okay, we can look at distance, or we can take it even further. One's a solid line, and one is a dashed line. I am trying to accent these differences as best as possible. That means that this interaction, I cannot call an ionic bond. Because it's not an ionic bond. An ionic bond, I could represent as that line between the two atoms. Okay? So I have to come up with a new name for this. What name do we use? There's actually two names that come out of this. There's one which is more appropriate name. electrostatic. We're looking at an electrostatic interaction between those two molecules. Okay. For the ionic, the positive negative. It only works for our ionic bonds, so that's why it's up in red. Okay. We'll come back to that one in a second. When we go to our medium interaction, okay, to get that medium interaction, I needed a polar covalent bond. Okay. What kind of name do we come up with here? This one's a little bit less creative. If I have a positive and a negative, I have two poles. Two poles sounds kind of boring, so let's call that first molecule a dipole. Okay, so we converted two into di, now we sound fancier. But that's only one molecule. We have a second molecule. What does that second molecule have? How can we name that second molecule? It's also a dipole. What intermolecular force do we come up with as far as a name? It is a dipole-dipole force. Okay, really, really creative, but hey, it's what it is. Okay, so our new attractive or attraction between those is now a dipole-dipole force. The only time we get that dipole-dipole force is when we're looking at a compound that has polar covalent bonds. Okay, what happens when we now move to our weak force? Okay, well, it turns out that this force is so weak that even when we went through and predicted, okay, there's no reason for that carbon and hydrogen to interact with that other one. So initially, what did we decide as chemists that value was, that attractive force? You want to attach a number to it? To a first approximation, it's zero. So when we first started dealing with intermolecular forces, we said that that force was zero, which means we ignored it. Turns out that particularly when you move up into the gas phase, find out it's not zero. Okay, that's a pretty huge discovery. Something that we would have assumed to be absolutely nothing now actually has a value. Okay, so because of that, it typically gets named for the person that actually said, you guys are idiots, it actually does have a value. That person 
It was London. Okay? So you're looking at a London force. Okay? I'm not, or actually, I'm not sure on the London. I think that might be the location. The name of the person that originally discovered it? Van der Waals. So we can hear it referred to as London forces or Van der Waals forces. Van der Waals was the person. I don't know why I said London. Okay, maybe he was in London. I don't know. Something close enough. Okay. The last name for it that I would say is actually a better name is a dispersion force. Okay, so you really get all sorts of fun names associated with this one. I would argue that the dispersion force is probably the best one because it actually gives us some information. Van der Waals is the guy's name. Who cares? London, let's assume that's where he came from. Who cares? And then dispersion force. What does dispersion mean? How things spread out. When we're looking at bonds and interactions, what are we looking at interacting? The electrons. What we're concerned about is how the electrons moved in that bond. Or said another way, how the electrons were dispersed. Okay? So we've got now three new names for these different interactions. And we now also know that if we know something about the bond, we can now predict the force. Okay? Why is that relevant? Oh, crap. So here's all our forces. We'll come back to hydrogen bonding here in a second. Okay? One of the other names that we can come up for electrostatic, and this is one of the reasons why it's confusing, is not only do we get electrostatic for a name, we also refer to it as ionic, okay? which is a bad name for this. Why? Because it's looking the same as a bond. We're giving a force, which is the attraction between molecules, the exact same name as we give a bond. Two very distinctly different interactions. One is involving the sharing of electrons. The other one is involving how do we stabilize those after the fact. Okay? So the ionic bonding force is a terrible, terrible name. To give it electrostatic makes a, a lot more sense. That can help clarify it. We also get our dipole-dipole. So we could, well, since I've got it, might as well do it. Okay. So to get our ionic or electrostatic force, we needed to have what type of bond? The bond we had to have was ionic. To get our dipole-dipole force, what type of bond did we need? To get our dipole-dipole bond, we needed a polar covalent bond. To get our London dispersion or our van der Waals forces, what type of bond did we need? Our bond had to be covalent. Or if we want to get super specific, we can call it nonpolar covalent. Okay. We've talked about hydrogen bonding before. That's an interesting thing. Why is bonding in quotes? Hydrogen bonding is not a bond. It is a force. Okay? It is looking at how two different molecules interact with each other. Why does it get its own special name? Well, let's go through and take a look at a hydrogen bonding example first. How do you describe that spot? between the oxygen and the hydrogen with my arrow. Define that spot for me. It is a bond. What type of bond is it? It is a polar covalent bond. For those of you saying hydrogen bond, careful. Our term hydrogen bond is referring to the force. That is a bond between an oxygen and a hydrogen, not a hydrogen bond. Okay. Stupid nomenclature system. Don't get me wrong on that, but that's the way it is. That is a polar covalent bond. What type of bond is in our second molecule? Polar covalent. If I now want to look at the attraction between those two molecules, what type of force is that? 
We have a polar covalent bond and a polar covalent bond, which gives us what force? Dipole, dipole. Why on earth do we call it hydrogen bonding then? Because the dipole generated between the hydrogen and oxygen is so large that it actually supersedes the dipole-dipole interaction. So what we end up doing is further classifying this hydrogen bonding interaction as a super strong dipole dipole force. Oh, you monkey. Uh, ah. So weird. Our hydrogen bonding force is a super strong, God, man, super strong dipole dipole force. Okay. It is so much stronger that we give it a new name. Okay. So to get hydrogen bonding, we must have a dipole-dipole first. Then what's our secondary rule? Not only do we need to have a hydrogen, okay, so I can accept that as a second rule. Hydrogen is present. But we have one more rule on that. That hydrogen must be bound to Here, and you mouth it out over there. Sounds good. Bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. If these rules are satisfied, then we have hydrogen bonding. If they are not satisfied, it is not hydrogen bonding. So let's take a look at an example. Carbon to hydrogen and oxygen to hydrogen. What is the attractive force now between oxygen and hydrogen? Is that a hydrogen bonding force. What's rule number one? Dipole, dipole. Do we have a dipole between our oxygen and our hydrogen? Yes, because oxygen is more electronegative. So the oxygen generates a partial negative, and our hydrogen generates a partial positive. What happens to our carbon hydrogen? Do we have a dipole? No. Do we have a dipole, dipole force then? No. What type of interaction there? Not hydrogen bonding. Okay? That's all you really need to know in this case. What happens if I now switch that up? Yeah. Mm, yeah, I think I can do this. Do carbon chlorine. Do I have a dipole? Yeah, this one gets, uh, I don't want to go down that path. That one's too tricky. Does the hydrogen have to be in both of them? No, but we need the oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine in both, which is why I'm avoiding that. What type of interaction do we have now? We have the dipole-dipole. Do we have a hydrogen present in our interaction? Yes. Do we have that hydrogen bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine? Yes. We now have hydrogen bonding. Okay. There are further nuances of this rule that you do not need to know for the sake of this class, so we won't worry about those. If you're concerned about them, you can talk to me after class. Okay. Here gets to the next big point. When we went back and looked at our smiley faces, we said two atoms that didn't interact, and then they slowly started to interact more and more and more until eventually they were fully bonded, which means we had a gra uh, gradation, yeah, gradation moving from no interaction to fully interacting. Okay? It's not next stage, next stage, next stage, next stage, next stage, next stage. We're looking at slowly bringing those atoms closer and closer, which means it's a continuous spectrum of interactions. Within that continuous spectrum, we've decided to put arbitrary limits on both our ionic bonding, for instance. That arbitrary limit was saying electronegativity had to be bigger than 1.7. Our arbitrary limit on covalent bonds, so our difference, had to be less than 0.5. We established those limits. Why did we put those in there? When you look at a rainbow, what colors do you see? Red. Come on. Orange, yellow, blue, green, indigo, violet. How many of you 
saw uh, burgundy. Okay. Why do you not specify burgundy or mauve? I don't even know what mauve is. Uh, or uh, I need some more help with some colors. What's a crazy color? Lime green. Do you see lime green? Okay. Your rainbow gives you all of those colors. Why do you only specify red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet? We put arbitrary limits on those color spectrums. Why did we do that? So that we can define and interpret the rainbow better. We're doing the exact same thing with our forces and our bonds. We've put on arbitrary limits on where we see distinctions. Anything that's in that border, switching between a London dispersion force and a dipole-dipole, is going to be confusing as all hell, which is why we don't look at it. We look at our extreme cases. All right? Why is that important? Well, that gets us to this color wheel aspect. What we are effectively doing is looking at a smooth transition all the way around, where we're looking at a London dispersion, which is effectively no interactions whatsoever. Okay? And we slowly increase the interaction all the way around the circle until eventually we increase it so much that we're now at a covalent bond where they are equally sharing electrons. So we're looking at that moving from nothing to complete sharing all the way around as we move, what is that, counterclockwise around that ring, starting with our London dispersion. Why else have all those other colors in there then? Well, what type of force did we say was generated from a covalent bond? Our London dispersion. Why is that important? What color is our covalent bond on my color wheel? Okay, purpley black. Where's our purpley black color and our corresponding force? London dispersion force. If we look at a polar covalent bond, we're looking at a color somewhere in the green range. What is the corresponding color in our force? Gets us to dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding as a force. The color wheel effectively allows you to match the type of bond with the type of force that you would predict out of it. Okay? This becomes huge in organic chemistry, ultimately becomes huge in all of chemistry. It's what allows you to predict all of these possible uh, transitions that we look at on the, what is that, the right? Phase transitions, vapor pressure, viscosity, surface tension, solubility, reactivity. Being able to predict why two molecules interact with each other comes back to this chart. Okay? It is massively important. Okay? How does it work? If we look at a phase transition, okay, let's look from liquid to gas. What has to happen to move from a liquid to a gas? What are you trying to do? You have to add heat. What is that heat doing? That is breaking the interactions that are holding each of those molecules next to each other in the liquid. That's how we get into the gas. We have to add that heat to break that interaction. Let's take a look at water versus uh, methane. What phase is methane? A gas. What phase is water? Liquid. Interesting. Different phases. <coughs> Relatively the same size. So why, for the exact same size molecule, do we get different phases in their natural states? Well, what's holding water as a liquid? It's the attractive force between those water molecules. What force is that in water? Well, what type of bond do we have in water? Between an oxygen and a hydrogen. Type of bond? Polar covalent. If we now move over to forces, our polar covalent bo bond naturally translates into a dipole-dipole force. Once we've got the dipole-dipole, we can now decide, do we have hydrogen bonding? Do we have a hydrogen bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine? Yes, we have hydrogen bonding. How strong of a force is that? Relatively strong on our force system. When we look at methane, what's methane? I know, that was unfair. CH4. What types of bonds do we find in CH4? Covalent bonds. What type of force do we generate from covalent bonds? 
London dispersion. Which one's stronger, hydrogen bonding or London dispersion? Hydrogen bonding, which means the attractive force between water molecules in water is much stronger than it is in methane. Why does that have an impact on the temperature required to translate into the gas? That more energy means I have to put in more heat to break that molecule free. So if we have a stronger intermolecular force, what does that mean happens to my boiling point? That boiling temperature must get higher. Pretty much all of these possible interactions come back to being able to interpret the forces. How do we get our forces? This is why you need to understand what bonds there are within a structure. So that when you look at an individual bond, you can immediately classify that as a polar covalent bond, which then means that is a dipole-dipole bond, which then means that I need a more energy to break it. Okay? When I look at those physical properties. Okay? It's huge. I cannot stress enough how important this concept is in being able to manipulate what's happening within these bonds and how that translates to the forces. Everything you do in your everyday life comes back to bonds and forces. Okay? Being able to interpret and understand this is huge for anything in chemistry. Yes? So if something has a stronger bond, does that, it applies to solubility too? Like, less solubility is going to be the next thing that we're going to talk about. How do we apply this to solubility? Well, when we look at solubility, we need first a couple definitions. Solubility is the ability of anything to dissolve into a liquid. What if it doesn't dissolve into a liquid? It's insoluble, okay? Or, no, I think it's in, not unsoluble. Is it? Non-soluble. That works too. <laughs> what about miscibility? Well, now miscibility is effectively the same definition except slightly tweaked. Now it's the ability of any liquid to dissolve in any other liquid. So it's very, very specific to our liquids, okay? What if it doesn't, two liquids don't mix? Now it's immiscible or non-miscible, okay? How is this reference back to our intermolecular forces? Well, the rule of thumb that you'll hear thrown out there is, and I bolded something that I think is important to it, the rule of thumb is like dissolves like. It's a pretty crappy rule. It's really like forces will dissolve like forces, okay? When we look at water, we had a strong intermolecular force because our positive was trying to cancel out the negative. Okay? So if we're going to dissolve something into water, we must still cancel out that positive and negative interaction. If we can't balance that charge out, water says, get out of here. I'm going to stay interacting with myself. So we must still have that same type of force to allow it to dissolve. So if we take a look at water and say that structure, anybody know the name of that structure for the first one? Of course you don't, because we're all really young, right? Mm -hmm. Ethanol. Of course you don't know the answer to the next question. Is water and ethanol soluble or miscible? Mm -hmm. right. If you go out to the bar pretty often, you might know this. Yeah, absolutely they're miscible. Okay. They definitely mix with each other. Ethanol and water are completely miscible liquids. Why would those two liquids mix? Well, like forces dissolve like forces. What's our strongest force in water? Hydrogen bonding. What's our strongest force in ethanol? Hydrogen bonding. How similar is hydrogen bonding to hydrogen bonding? They're the same force, which means we would predict those two to mix, and they should be soluble. What happens when we move to the other compound? What intermolecular force do we get in water? Hydrogen bonding. What intermolecular force do we get in propane? London dispersion forces. How similar are London dispersion and hydrogen bonding? Very dissimilar. So they won't dissolve in each other. We could push this a little bit further. We made that carbon chain a lot longer. What we would effectively have is oil. 
When you mix oil with water, what happens? They separate. We get two layers. That's what we're relying on, on immiscible liquids. If we put them into the same container, they won't mix together. We get a heterogeneous solution because the two separate. If they mixed completely, we would have homogeneous. Okay, does that answer your question that you were starting to say? Okay, what happens when we make it to ionic compounds? What intermolecular force do we have between water and sodium chloride? Hydrogen bonding and ionic. This one gets a little bit trickier. How similar of a force is that? It's actually the next force up. Those are relatively similar. It seems a bit odd because ionic bonding is a wicked strong force. It's so strong of a force that sometimes we actually classify it as a bond. Okay, so why on earth would water actually dissolve sodium chloride? Okay, well, it has to do with other properties of water, which please say on the next slide. If we take a look at water as far as hydrogen bonding and we draw out a molecule of sodium chloride, Sodium chloride turns into sodium ions and chloride ions. That positive sodium wants what around it? Negatives. So we can coordinate our water to it. Well, there's our water coordinating the sodium. That intermolecular force, effectively hydrogen bonding, it's kind of, at least as an approximation, versus if we look at the intermolecular force between sodium and chloride. Which one's the stronger force? Sodium and chloride. Well, if that force is so much stronger, it should stay preferentially with the chloride and not with the water, which means they wouldn't dissolve. So why on earth does water actually dissolve our salt? It's not just one water molecule or even two, we're probably looking at a sequence of four or five water molecules. So we are no longer evaluating one hydrogen bond. We are looking at the stabilizing effect of four or five hydrogen bonding interactions. And that has to do with the size of that atom, our sodium ion. The bigger that charged species is, the more water molecules we can put around it. And because it's a weak interaction, not a bond, I can do a whole bunch of different interactions around it. Because a bond requires that sharing of electrons. I don't have to share electrons now. Now it's just a rough, hey, just helping you out. Okay? So when we look at our forces, we can get a whole lot more forces okay, per square inch than we can get a bond. So what we're looking at when we're looking at solubility and say some of our other factors is how do those forces weigh out in comparison to those bonds? In some cases, it's an obvious interaction. In some cases, it's not. Okay? Our rule of thumb, just so you guys know, if it's an ionic compound, what happens to its solubility? In general, ionic compounds are soluble. There are some exceptions to that. Okay, what are those exceptions known as? The solubility rules. Okay, and what is happening with your solubility rules? The attractive force between our ions now becomes so great that water cannot break that apart. And no matter how many water molecules we put around those ions, it can't separate it out and keep it dissolved. Okay. This is one of the reasons why when we look at is dissolving a salt a chemical versus a physical uh, change comes back to what happens when we actually dissolve a salt. When we dissolve a salt, we break it into the ions to actually get those compounds separated and dissolved. Okay. So it's kind of a neat property when we're looking at water. Questions about that? Okay, next aspect that I'm probably going to have to reiterate uh, on Tuesday of next week because it's going to be a really important topic for your final and I really don't have enough time to do this is if we go through and now take our water solutions 
and we want to try and interact them. Okay, so we want to come up with some way to measure them. So if we take two solutions, aluminum tribromide and silver nitrate, and we mix them. Okay, first off, you should be able to predict the result. Okay, I gave you the answer to it, but that result of that is going to be dependent on what? Realizing that it's a double replacement reaction, and then the next part of that, what do you need to determine if a double replacement reaction actually occurred? Careful activity series is for single replacements. You need the solubility rules, okay, to see if a solid actually forms. Okay, so we could go through mix these. Yay, we made a solid. Okay, cool. That's fine. Let's make it a little bit more interesting. Now, when I go through and do this reaction, I want to quantify how much silver bromide I can make. I've decided that silver bromide is an important chemical used in treating cancer. Okay, don't take my word at that. Um, but that's something I want. I want that chemical. Okay? Well, if I'm going to run this reaction, I'm really concerned about making that chemical. I want to know how much of that chemical I can make. Okay? So when I want this, run this reaction, I get a solid. So I could mix a bunch of chemicals, and I get the solid, and I can weigh it, and I can be like, oh, that's how much I made. Okay? But let's say I want to know how much I could make before I actually make it. Okay? To do that, I have to know some information about my starting materials. Okay? This would be going back to your limiting reagent or percent yield questions. So I would need to know the moles of aluminum bromide that I put in there and know the moles of the silver nitrate so that I can determine the moles of silver bromide produced in this reaction, right? Vaguely familiar with that calculation? Okay. What makes this more challenging? When I move into the lab, or when you move into the lab, how do you measure out most of these chemicals? Grams. Okay, you get the mass. Okay, what makes this problem tricky? What phase are our starting materials? Aqueous. So when I go to measure out the mass, what am I measuring the mass of? I'm measuring the mass of, say, my aluminum bromide and water. When this reaction runs, is water a reactant? How do you know it's not a reactant? It's not in the equation. So that when I go to weigh out this solution, yes, I'm now getting a mass of that silver bromide solution, but within that mass, there's a bunch of junk that I do not care about. There is a bunch of water there. I need to be able to remove that water from my reaction or from my calculation to determine how much silver bromide is present. So what I really need to know about each of those solutions is the concentration of the aluminum bromide in the water solution. Okay? All of you guys have had before lab. I think that's true. Everybody here has had me in lab. We talked about this in, with the last lab, looking at molarity. It's just another new conversion factor that allows you to relate the constant or the amount of a substance. Oh, you're not in my lab. The amount, but if you think back, are you in lab, right? Yeah, same thing. The amount of a particular substance within the volume of liquid. It allows us to effectively subtract the water from our calculation, okay? which is massively important when we deal with solution chemistry. So we will talk about molarity again on Monday because it really is that important and it will show up on your exam. Um, I would highly recommend over the break, okay, so this is just personal advice, 